Dave Burrow, which is Tuesday, May 14th uh, at about uh, 11 a.m. I'm going to pre-record this week's webcast. I've got a commitment that I've got to take care of later on. It's my spouse's birthday, so uh, it's an important evening. I won't be on a 4 o'clock call. Um, just want to go from the top. Today is going to be a fairly quick call, but I just want to review things because there are some moving parts in the market. Um, from the top down, you know, our view has been we've been in a structural bull market since 2013, the breakout above the 2000 highs. Uh, and then we look at a last couple of secular bull markets. We've seen, you know, a consistent rise above the weekly or 200 week moving average, which has been the same thing we've seen since 2013. Last month, we gave up a little over 3% in the S&P. And so far this month, we've regained about 2.7%. We're trading basically at highs or very darn close to it. Um, so we obviously want to know what's going on internally. We talked last month about the fact that we were, you know, at risk of sort of a 5% pullback. I think top to bottom, it was about 5.7%. Uh, and, uh, and here we are, you know, close to capturing those highs. Looking at the shorter term chart, you can see uh, that we've moved our way back up. Our indicators turned down uh, as we broke through this channel that we've been in since the October lows. Uh, and of course, uh, we found found a footing here below the 50 day market rallied. Our short term indicators turned up about two weeks ago. Uh, this week, our long term indicators turn higher. Uh, so we'll cover that over the course of the call. But we're back above all of the moving averages, including the eight day, including the 21 day moving average. Uh, when we look outside to the US, you know, we're seeing continued strength uh, in the uh, MSCI X US index. Japan has been very strong. Uh, certainly India has been very, very strong. Uh, Euro stocks 50 today making new highs. Uh, the uh, uh, markets in Latin America stronger. In particular, I point out Argentina, uh, which is a favorite uh, of Stanley Bruckenmiller's. Uh, I've been talking about this over the last little while. All of these markets owned in our global macro portfolio and our global equities portfolio. Now the TSX looks a lot like the rest of the world uh, with its heavy uh, dependent in financials and industrials and materials and then the uh, TSX now trading basically at new highs for the year. So equities as a whole continue to look uh, very attractive and look to be sort of reaccelerating. In the fixed income world, we think that we saw this very significant generational bottom in your 80 to 20 and the reversal of this series of lower highs and lower lows of 2020 has been significant. We now see higher highs and higher lows. So, you know, a change from a structural bear market in rates to a structural bull market in rates, uh, which means that bond prices, you know, continue to be weak. We're now basically four years into a bond bear market. And you can see all of the moving averages moving lower. And you can see the price below all of those moving averages. So until something changes, this is an asset class that is challenged. If like in other bond bear markets, rates work their way higher over the next 15 or 20 years, you would expect to have very little by way of return above the rate of inflation. So very important. The US dollar we talked about over the last few weeks as having made a recent and near term highs and relative strength became overbought like it did uh, back in February, like it did back in the October equity lows, like it did back in last year, last summer's lows, um, you know, has been backing off. And I do think that that's interesting considering the fact that, you know, inflation data continues to come in hot. Today's producer price index data uh, came in uh, hotter than expected. Um, and I think that some of the cooling in inflation is expected to come from rents, which is in services. Uh, we'll see over the next little while, but certainly the inflation data continues hot, which would suggest a stronger dollar. Although even with that hotter inflation data, the dollar is weaker today. From a commodities perspective, you know, we're just in the very early stages of what is likely the second wave of a new long-term bull market in commodities. Really, we've seen copper on a tear uh, on the back of commentary 
about a, a deficit going forward in world production. We're going to need copper for electric vehicles. We're going to need elect copper to build out data centers for AI. We're going to need copper to, to, to rebuild uh, the power grid in the U.S. And uh, today there is some important uh, legislation uh, and new rules uh, being put forward on, uh, on expanding the replacement of uh, thousands of miles of power lines on copper goes into that stuff. Uh, uranium continues to be strong, and we highlighted over the last little while this breakout in gold. And, uh, you know, we're far from gold bugs, but the last time you got this type of breakout, you got a very substantial move higher. We think that this is the very early stages of that. And we see it in silver. Uh, silver breaking out of the last sort of 10-year consolidation range over the last couple of months. That's a big deal. Uh, and also the fact that silver has started to outperform gold is important because that has been typified in each of the more real gold bull markets or precious metal bull markets in the past. Silver is at 10 minutes and 20, a little bit higher volatility, higher breakout. So those are all interesting points. So at the high level, stocks continue to outperform bonds. That's the S&P versus the aggregate bond index. Uh, and commodities are outperforming bonds. This is what should happen if we're in a more inflationary world. And these are the types of assets we need to own if we want to try and offset inflation. Sadly, people continue to look through the rear view mirror. They continue to be sellers of commodities, despite the fact that they are providing an excellent inflation hedge. Uh, they are buying stocks, but the biggest flows are going into fixed income. Of course, they're now in a 40-year bear market and not showing any sign of reverse. So people are going to the old playbook. They're expecting higher rates from the Fed to cause a recession, to cause a, a, a reduction in demand. Uh, but clearly, the charts don't show that, that show that picture. So this U.S. dollar weakening, I think, is kind of a big deal. We want to watch that. It's very supportive of commodities. It's support, supportive of global stocks and we've seen both of them start new bull markets so this is kind of where we've been focused uh, so far over the last you know 15 16 months as these trends have started to play out the weekly weighted s p is up 22 percent the tsx close in behind at about 19 and a half percent the aggregate bond index just slightly positive at 0.81 uh, our equity strategy over the period is up about 33 percent our income portfolio, which is a, a tactically managed basket of income producing securities up about 26% uh, and our global macro portfolio uh, up a little over 30%. So all three benefiting from these trends. So we don't have to be everywhere. We like to sort of talk about the idea that we need to identify the key structural themes in the market and focus in the areas of market leadership. Um, we always watch for signs of new leadership and, and signs of old leadership as we see them. Uh, and in the absence of leadership, have a willingness to pivot back. So our portfolios do change, and that's why we do these webcasts. You know, our goal is to be tactical and make sure our portfolios are in line with what's actually happening in the market. Um, just quickly, we use our top-down breadth-based model to identify out of the investable universe that we have, which groups are seeing net inflows and that are behaving the way that they should be, given what we think we know. And then we find specific ideas from single securities, a universe of about 60,000 securities, looking for those securities that have strong and improving fundamentals, strong technical picture, uh, and between the two of them, fundamentally sound and technically attractive are able to take advantage of the themes that we're focusing and producing what are what drives our portfolio. We believe that 70% of returns comes from uh, being in the right neighborhood, the right asset classes or sectors, and then finding securities that are good getting better to express that view. Okay, so um, as of last week, talked about the fact that over the previous two weeks we've started to see our short-term indicators show improvement and when we look at today it's continued so long-term breadth model for the nyse or the percentage of stocks and uptrends once again expanding 
uh, sitting at above 60%. The Canadian market actually continued to be strong despite April's weakness in stocks globally. The short-term indicators present a stock trading above the 50-day moving average, positive solidly across the board. This week, we had a big jump in the number of stocks with positive weekly price momentum. In other words, a a resumption in upward trajectory. Percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows significantly outnumbering uh, highs, significantly outnumbering new lows. Uh, And the percent of stocks moving above their 150-day or 30-week moving average is, is currently higher in the S&P. So market is, again, broadening. We believe that when the market is broadening, it's like there are these big shock absorbers under the market. When breadth is expanding, it tends to be able to absorb bad news. When the PPI data came out today with an immediate sell-off in the futures, but very quickly the market found its footing and the key leadership team found their footing, the market has absorbed the news. So despite consolidation in April, the market recouped so far, virtually everything given up in April and May, and our expectation was that when five months are positive, uh, uh, November, December, January, February, and March, and then you have a negative month in April, it tends to be a short-term correction. And in all of the cases where that was the case since 1950, the market was positive and averaged 11% to the end of the year, and these breadth models are very supportive of that. Let's talk quickly about leadership themes. We're not going to get too focused on granular details today. Um, Financial services, the XLF ETF, continuing this rising relative strength trend. In other words, continuing to outperform the market very close to back to highs. Uh, The industrial sector continuing to do the same thing. We've had lots of focus in these two sectors over the course of the last 16 months. Material sector, after a little pullback, uh, through the early part of the year, the last three months, we're working our way higher again, you know, led, as we talked about, by copper miners. Um, energy trading very, very close relative highs. Now, it's important to remember this. We are just exiting a multi-year bear market. These are the very beginnings of trends, both in materials and in energy. It makes sense given the fact that we only recently in the last two, three years have started to see a pickup in inflation. These are things that help offset inflation because prices can rise to meet the cost of the increase of costs uh, and there's limited supply. To put it in perspective, and we mentioned this last week, if we take each of the last sort of bull markets in energy, in red, is the longevity and the magnitude of this bull market so far. It's only just beginning, and our guess is, you know, there's a long way to go. But we'll see. We'll continue to measure it. Technology, you know, is rallying, although the relative strength has been waning since the end of last year, so a much less dominant position, much more important to be targeting some very specific names. NVIDIA will be coming up to report its earnings shortly. Um, The move higher in the utilities that we highlighted over the last six weeks has continued with a very sharp rally higher, driven higher primarily by expectation for increasing demand out of AI and data centers uh, and electrification and so on. The two biggest companies in the XLU are Becerra Energy, which is a leader in renewables, and Southern Company, which is the only company to have brought on a new nuclear power facility in the most recent number of years. And those are the two names that we focused in as the leaders of the group. And they're having very sharp rallies going back to the middle of March. Southern Company is no different. So these are the two positions that we've decided to focus on in utilities. Happy utilities are out of favor for quite some time. No real change in consumer discretionary. This is a group that we continue to avoid. Uh, Relative strength has been waning. In fact, if you look at the XLY ETF, 20% 20% of this ETF is Amazon, and Amazon is acting just fine. So if you take Amazon out, this would look a lot worse. So, you know, we really think that if you're going to be in consumer discretionary, it needs to be a rifle shot approach. And you could even argue that Amazon shouldn't actually been in the, be in the consumer 
it became a point that that type of thing about the, the notion of the, the AI um, was, was going to be mischaracterized and abused as a form of economic incentive. So at the sector level, from a breadth perspective, we've seen a number of groups which are in capital letters turn positive from a breadth perspective. Groups that have been behaving the best, insurance, just on the, low, on the lower bound here, the percentage of stocks in uptrend, so insurance, 65% of stocks, the insurance group are in uptrend. Builders, electric utility, oil and gas. Capital markets, while the Wall Street group has over 50% of stocks in uptrend. Transport, precious metals, oil services, chemicals, lots of industrials, basic materials, <coughs> um, and financials in the leading group. And when we look at the groups that have the smallest number of stocks in uptrend or the narrowest breadth, and the ones that are in small letters, meaning there's no improving breadth, in fact, breadth has been contracting. We've got high multiple groups like biotech and software. We've got consumer groups like travel and leisure and retail. We've got bond proxies, things that act like bonds like telecom. Uh, healthcare is not economically sensitive and is probably in the political crosshairs in the next couple of next few months with the FCC uh, election. Real estate, auto, again, consumer. These are the groups that we really are avoiding. We're not seeing any improvement in breadth. We run these models daily. We watch the signs of change. When we saw electric utilities reverse up, which was down at the lower end a few weeks ago, that's where we got engaged to try and buy the leading features. So we're trying to focus on the groups that show expanding breadth. We're trying to avoid the groups that are showing deterioration in breadth. This is a market where the good are getting better and the weak are getting weaker. So what does it all mean? Financials continue to be our most significant thing now, almost 25% of firm assets. Industrials are a significant overweight versus the index. Technology is a significant underweight versus the index. Energy, almost twice market weight. Materials, four times market weight. Healthcare is significant underweight, communication services versus telecom, considerable underweight, uh, consumer discretionary and real estate underweights, and we've brought our utility weight up to a market weight that we'll, that we'll see whether we can really get there. So things in general continue to go well. Outside the U.S., the MSCI the All World Index is up about 6%. If I converted that to Canadian dollars for comparative purposes, it's about 9.5%. Uh, the uh, global treasury market has stopped from other countries' issuance down 5.7%, and the global fund up about 13% since the beginning of the year. So, again, targeting is making a big difference. You can make money as an active manager in this market if you think there are haves and there are have-nots. When we look at the risk indicators outside of our breadth models, credit spreads continue to come in. There really is no sign of a credit problem. When we look at volatility, the VIX, the VIX is solidly down in the range that we tend to be in during cyclical bull markets. And so we watch for signs of risk, but at this point, actually the market looks remarkably resilient. Now, we've been in a tightening cycle for the last two years. And during that time, companies took down their inventories. I put this up last week, but I want to highlight it. When inventories get low, you need to start restocking. And we know that in the last month, the purchasing managers' data turned positive for the first time in 16 months. So we don't think we have an industrial recession in front of us. It may be the consumer slows down. It may be there are headwinds in certain industries because of inflation. But as investors, we are embracing the risk of inflation by owning assets that benefit in a more inflationary world. We are focused on being the lender, not the borrower. Companies that benefit during a time of rising rates. Now, the upshot is we continue to be in a structural bull market. We've only just started the next cyclical bull market, likely to go on 
repeat a few years before they have a major correction. And I think that we're positioned well. If things get more difficult, we will get more defensive, as we tend to do when markets get sloppy. But at this point, we think the market will only get sloppy. So short update for this week. I want to thank everybody for tuning in, and we'll be back live next Tuesday at 4 o'clock. Uh, we hope that uh, you find this useful. And if you've got questions that we aren't answering, please send them to us. Uh, please reach out live on one of our webcasts and give us a call. We're happy to discuss uh, these things, and we appreciate you all tuning in. Thanks so much, and I look forward to talking to you next week.